Hi there, I'm, uh, I'm Jesse. I'm a programmer at a company called Square. And um, I'm here to not talk to you about decoding the secrets of binary data. I'm here to talk to you about encoding. And uh, that was just a catchy, sexy title to draw you all in. And now that you're here, I'm, I'm going to bore you with like really low-level stuff that I think is really fun. Um, so uh, this is the stereotype of our industry. Zero and one. You talk to people and at Thanksgiving dinner, and they're like, oh, you're a programmer. Oh, zeros and ones. I love those zeros and ones. And, and you're like, I do too. I just saw the roundest zero the other day. It was beautiful. So this is, this is our life. But um, for, the, for most of us, we're like eight levels of abstractions above the zeros and ones. And so for the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about the zeros and ones, and I'm going to work my way up. And um, the way I like to think of this is that uh, all these computer programs that we're building are like completely magic to everybody who's using these programs. They have no idea how they work. And if the computer programs are magic, then collectively we are a group of magicians. And so if, if we're a bunch of magicians, we like, it's magic until you understand how the trick works. Once you understand how the trick works, it's kind of boring. And I'm going to tell you all that really boring stuff about how these tricks work. And uh, I'm hoping it will make us all better magicians. So my goals for today are to uh, get comfortable with bytes. And hopefully that will help us to write simpler, more efficient programs. Um, my plan is to uh, sort of work from the bottom up. So I'm going to start at the very lowest level of our, of our system. I'm going to go through some history, uh, history of uh, why things work the way they do in 2016. A lot of it is just like historical accidents. We're going to do some math. And uh, I'm going to hopefully show some code. So we're going to get back in our DeLorean time machines to 1095. And uh, something very interesting happened in 1095. The very first interesting, useful letter was sent. Um, and a thousand years ago, communication was very expensive. So if you wanted to send a letter, you know, like, hey, let's go to war, that's like an expensive letter to send. You potentially need to, let's see, first, the letter is, uh, well, let me talk about the great things about the letter. The letter is human readable. So if you, if you receive a letter, you can read it. That's great. And uh, we see here it's signed. This is also really wonderful because a signed letter proves definitely that this is from Alex. This is like almost as good as cryptographic. Um, but uh, the, the letter is like generally lousy. We don't use letters very much today. Um, and the reason it was like a big deal when the first letters happened a thousand years ago is that they're slow and dangerous to transmit, especially a thousand years ago. If you're uh, carrying a letter that says, let's go to war, you don't want to be intercepted and killed. Um, letters are awkward to store. Uh, we don't have like filing cabinets full of all of our emails. That would be terrible. And uh, one thing that's really annoying in 1095 is that letters require literacy. So we teach all of our children today how to read and write English because they might have to write a letter. Um, fast forward 800 years to the like relatively modern times, and uh, we've got telegraphs. And uh, tele telegraphs are really cool. This is like the beginning of it all. Um, I'm going to go to San Francisco, and I'm going to just like string a really long wire to New York City. And then I'm going to take this wire, and I'm just going to apply an electrical current to it. And what's really cool is, is that if I apply a current to a wire in San Francisco, the people in New York can detect that that current is electrified. And so this is the basis for uh, electronic communication. Um, so as soon as this happens, it's like inevitable that Morse code will be created. Morse code is really nice because it's, um, it's, it's generally very compact. You can send a lot of messages in a very short amount of uh, time. And uh, this is the Morse code table. And the message I always like to send is my breakfast order. So we'll send uh, D O N U T. And it's you know dash, dot, dot, dash, 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 dot, 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 dash, dash. And you hear that, and you're just like, I love donuts. Um, so we're going to take that, 
and we're going to transmit it. This time, the donut is coming from New York to San Francisco. And so we just send D-O-N-U-T. A person in New York is creating electrical signal. A person in San Francisco is observing it. And they know donuts. That's what they'll bring when they spend you know, two weeks traveling across the country. <laughs> um, so Morse code is really cool. Uh, it happens with telegraphs. Uh, peak rate is about 15 words per minute. So you could imagine like a really lousy Morse code based Twitter. Um, and it was wireless in 1898, which is also really cool. Um, when the Titanic sunk, they were like, we die in as Morse code, which is really cool. Um, Morse code is also kind of lousy. Uh, there's a very limited character set. You can't like have lowercase. So when somebody says donut, you're like, why are you shouting? Um, there's limited punctuation. And um, on average, the messages I said were 12 words. So that's, that's Morse code. That's like the sort of like pre-computer communication. And now we're going to go in. We're going to do some computer science. And um, a lot of us already know this binary stuff. But for me, when I started actually doing the zeros and ones, I like, was very vague about this stuff. And so I'm just going to go through and just go to like, some really low-level computer science fundamentals just to sort of remind everybody so the rest of my talk makes some sense. Um, I've got 205 blue squares. And I've represented it as a grid of 10 by 10, a grid of 10 by 10, and a line of 5. And 205 is just a random number I picked. But in this case, it's 200 plus 5. And I want to talk a little bit about how decimal encoding works. If you think of decimal encoding as a thing, it's like implicit in grain. You can't even really differentiate yourself between the 205 squares and the three digits 205 that we used to represent them. Um, 205 is the same as 2 times 100 plus 5 times 1. I'm just doing like basic math. And that's the same as 2 times 100 plus 0 times 10 plus 5 times 1. And um, we see here that these three digits, 100, 10, 1, are all subsequent powers of 10. So we have 10 squared times plus 10 to the 1 plus 10 to the 0. Everybody, if you remember from like grade 7 or something, things to the power of 0 are 1. That's weird. Um, so we get uh, 205 is 10 to the 2, 2, uh, 2 5. And then we can do the exact same technique, but binary. And so in this case, I've taken my 205 squares. I've rearranged them a bit. And now I have 128 plus 64 plus 8 plus 4 plus 1. You know this is 205 because the animation showed you. It was the uh, same squares. They're just in a different order. And in this case, I've got them in powers of 2. And I'm going to spread them out and just put in the gaps for the numbers that are missing. And so we end up with 1 times 128, 1 plus 64, 32, 16. And we get 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Great. And um, we basically take this, we convert those numbers into their powers of 2. So it goes from 2 to the 7, 2 to the 6, 2 to the 5, 2 to the 4. Lots of fun. Everybody loves their uh, powers of 2. And then eventually, the very last number is uh, 2 to the 0. And this stuff has like nice properties. We know that a number is even or odd if we represent it as powers of 2. And if the last digit is a 1, then it's an odd number. If the last digit is a 0, it's an even number. So take that and take all the uh, sort of like boilerplate out, and we just get our beautiful binary number. One thing that's really sort of convenient for binary nerds is that you can actually type a binary literal in Java as of version 7. So that's really cool. If you want to like improve the coolness of your code, just turn all your constants into binary literals. Um, so to recap this math stuff, Decimal lets you represent an integer as a sequence of digits. So 0 through 9, you can use those in a sequence to represent any number of blue squares that you may have. And binary lets you do the same thing, but the, uh, the alphabet is much smaller. You just have zeros and ones, and you can represent any number you want as a sequence of zeros and ones. And uh, if you are doing binaries in, um, like if you want to sort of make it different from 11 million, it's nice to prefix your binary numbers with 0b. That's a, uh, it's just like a, a nice way to make sure that people know, you know, how, bring 205 donuts and not 11 million donuts. That would be embarrassing. Um, you can represent uh, 2 to the n values with n bits. So if we have 
8 bits, we can represent two, 0 to 255. If you have 16 bits, we can represent uh, 0 to 65,535. Where have I seen that number before? Um, and then 32 bits gets me to um, 4 billion. Uh, 64 bits is uh, 18 billion billion. So this stuff adds up pretty quickly. And you can, um, you can represent basically any donut order with a very small number of bits. Um, so I'm going to do the exact same thing as we did with our Morse code. This time I'm going to send the number 205 from New York to San Francisco. And so it's just ones and zeros. And this is the same technique that's happening all of the time whenever your phone is sending a message to another computer. We're just taking, we're taking whatever numbers you say. We're going to take them, encode them in binary, and transmit them as just a pulses of zeros and ones. So there's like a, sort of like a hardware principle underlying these uh, zeros and ones. And um, all of the stuff that like our computer programs do, where we're like showing cool cat videos, is a consequence of layering these zeros and ones into more interesting things. So if we have a wire, like this wire from San Francisco to New York, or a wireless channel or Wi-Fi, we can take a wire that will transmit a single bit of information and then use binary encoding to transmit any size integer. This is really cool. And this layering technique is going to be the entire premise of the rest of this talk. We're just going to layer different things over and over each other. And we're going to see how we can represent all the things we care about. Um, one thing that's important is that the layer only works if the sender and the recipient agree on what we're sending. So if the sender thinks that they're sending Morse code and the recipient expects to be reading binary, bad things happen. You get bagels instead of donuts. It's terrible. Um, and uh, so we, we name these uh, interpretations of bits. And that named interpretation of bits is called an encoding. So I'm going to take a complicated message. I'm going to encode it somehow. And I'm going to say, I used you know, binary encoding to send this message, or I used Morse code to send this message. And if you know the encoding and the message, you can figure out what they're trying to tell you. So bytes, um, although we can represent any number as a series of zeros and ones, we really like 8-bit integers. The reason for this are just mostly accidental, but 8 bits is the sort of standard from now on. For a little while in the, uh, in the 60s, it was 6 bits. Computers were expensive then. An 8-bit integer is called a byte. And they have 256 values from 0 to 255. So let's go back to our history of computing. 1967, that's uh, almost 50 years ago. Uh, and so this is when ASCII is formed. And everybody knows ASCII stands for the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. This is uh, good stuff. And we think of ASCII as like an encoding or like a character set. But what ASCII really is, it's just a table of characters. And we can take a sequence of bytes and interpret them as characters. If you say, here's a, you know, a long sequence of, uh, of bytes, and you say, and it's ASCII, then you know that the, you're supposed to read it and interpret it as text. If you get a sequence of bytes and you're told it's an integer, then you can interpret it as integer. So uh, work on ASCII started in 1960. If you can believe it, they were working on ASCII for seven years. That's why it's so awesome. Um, it only uses seven bits. And like I said, in 1967, bits were expensive. And like, I mean this in a very, very real sense. Computers were like millions of dollars. Megabytes of storage were millions of dollars. Um, and so because we have seven bits, we have 128 different characters in ASCII. And here they are. Um, everybody has this memorized, I assume, right? Um, the, uh, probably the most interesting thing to know on this table is that the first two uh, columns in this presentation, the bits from 0 through 31, are all like control characters and new line characters and tabs. And then from 32 to 126 is like where the good stuff is. 32 is space. Sp um, so uh, let's do the thing that we do, which is let's make a donut. All right, D O N U T. And then this is like the first layer of our encoding. We've converted donut into a sequence of five numbers. And then we have to do another layer of encoding to convert it into bits. So we get, let's see, D O N U T. And so now we have donut as a sequence of bits. This is really awesome. Now we can like take a donut and send it over the, uh, over the wire. One other thing that's really nice here is, is that we're not shouting anymore. When we were doing it in Morse code, it was like, donut, but now it's like, donut. 
so the 1980s was a great time for the growth of the computer. We had bits, and computers were getting cheap enough so that people could afford them. Um, but we still have this ASCII character set that's very American. So your uh, you know, instant messaging in 1980s with your boss, and you're like, boss, what should I be working on? And your boss is like, resume polishing. But because we don't have, we don't have um, you know, any fancy characters, we don't have accents or French characters or Russian characters, this could be just like a massive interpretation problem. Maybe what you said was, boss, what should I be working on? And your boss is angry and is like, resume polishing, right? Which is a completely different thing for your boss to tell you. You're fired. Um, so the 80s and 90s were a very dark time for computers. Um, ASCII is English only, and unfortunately, non-English people also use computers. So the hacks that were working around this were terrible. Operating systems, you'd install your version of uh, you know, Windows 95, and you'd say, uh, it would say, you know, do you want this to be in French or do you want it to be in English? Don't, uh, don't make the wrong choice. Otherwise, you won't be able to use this computer for those other things. If you had a document, you could be an English document or a French document or a Greek document, but you couldn't have a single document that mixed the letters. Um, and there were all these different like special character sets that were f created around this time. If you you'll always see ISO 8859-1. This is like ASCII's evil twin. If you see it, run away. Um, so 1991 is the beginning of when we try and reconcile these character set problems. Um, and so we've got this thing that was invented called Unicode. And Unicode is this genius idea where we're like. Why don't we just put all of the languages, all of the characters, into a single system? And a code point is a universal ID for a character. So an E with an accent in French is an E with an accent in English. It's the same as an E with an accent in any other language. Really like nice simplification of the model. We don't have this thing where like with the ISO 8859-1 thing, you'd have like an E with an accent would be one character. It would be an E with an accent in French, but that same integer would be used for like an upside down R in Russian, or whatever that would be called. Um, so alongside this really nice giant character set table that I can't even show on my slides because it's literally 65,000 characters wide, they invented a character set called UTF-16, which would be how we would encode it. So you take, rather than saying, you know, we have six bits or seven bits or eight bits, we're like, let's do 16 bits. And that's two bytes per code point. Code point is the word I'm going to use to just represent an integer that corresponds to some character. And UTF-16 haunts us today. This is Java's char type. So if you have a char, it is a UTF-16 char. That's the same definition. And so I'm going to do my thing. I do my thing. I say D-O-N-U-T. And as you can see, when we do things with UTF-16, there's just like a ton of wasted space. There's just like all of these zeros here that just dramatically increase the size of your program in memory. Java programs, when you have a string that's five characters long, it's going to take 10 bytes of memory. And so, you know, the early 90s, these things were uh, called save icons, and you'd put them into your computer, <laughs> and you would save things onto them, and they were like, a buck fifty in 1990s dollars, which was like, like fifty dollars or something, and so you just burn lots of disks and it's bad. So, UTF-16 characters in summary, you can go because it's 16 bits. It's the it's the dex limit. We love it. Um, the code point for Emoji Donut is 127,849. Uh, and we look at this, and the math is bad because 127,849 code point is bigger than 6, 65,000. We have like a, this is like an Android developer's problem. Um, and so there's no donut code point in uh, UTF-16, which is like really tragic. Um, the computers weren't as fun in the 90s as they are today. Um, so Java's char is a broken type that is like designed poorly or designed in the 90s, I guess. Um, and so there's this like horrible workaround called surrogate pairs that 
we all have to deal with today when you're writing code. And a surrogate pair is like a multi-dex for, for a code point, uh, which is a really terrible thing to think about. Um, it splits a single code point across two Java chars. And as I said, it's an incredible pain. So let's see it. We're going to take the string cafe donut, and we're going to convert it into a char array. And we get is this like seven character char array for our six, uh, six code point string. And chars five and six each represent half a donut. It's not actually half a donut. That's ridiculous, but metaphorically, you can think of it this way. Um, the, uh, the thing that's important here is that the little triangles I've drawn in the, in the code point, this is me trying to remind you that these things self-identify as being the bottom half of a character or the top half of a character. So cafe donut, the little donut symbol says, I'm the bottom half, and this is ha half of the bits. And then the other, uh, the other char has the other half of the bits. And so when you're writing Java code, uh, naively, like a person who hates emoji, you'll write a, a loop like this that will say, you know, go through the chars of my string, get each char, and then print out the character at this index is this value. And quite tragically, instead of printing the six characters of cafe donut, we get cafe space and then two Unicode replacement characters. Sometimes you'll get question marks. This is really sad. This is like, this is like no donuts. So the solution is like much uglier in terms of code. Instead of looping through and saying I++ plus plus in the loop, we loop through I through the end of the string length. But instead of incrementing by one, we increment by the char count. And so and instead of getting a char C, we get an int C. The, basically, the char type is broken for emojis and a bunch of other useful characters. So you say, get the code point at this position. And if it finds itself in the bottom half of a surrogate pair, it will pull both halves out and give them to you. And so this is the sort of like only correct way to iterate the characters of a string. And in general, everything that you want to do with, this, with strings that's remotely interesting will be broken in this exact same way. Uh, and it's really sad. And so you like basically have to take the char type and just scrub it from your brain. And when you're using strings, you do this instead. So all right, we're making progress, 1998. Um, UTF-8 breaks onto the scene. And UTF-8 is the 8-bit tra Unicode transformation format. And it has a variable number of bytes per code point. The, other, the thing that's weird about UTF-16 is it's also variable length, but it's not really designed to be variable length. It's like a it's trap. And so UTF-8 is how modern apps today in 2016 transmit and store text. And what we hope is, is that years from now, UTF-8 will be the only char set that exists. Um, and we're making forward progress. This is kind of an old chart, but you can see that UTF-8 had a relatively slow start, and it's on the up, and everything else is every other character set is on the decline. And as an industry, we can just eventually get to the point where UTF-8 is the only character set we need to know about. Um, UTF-8 is awesome. Most common characters are one byte. Some are two and three bytes. The donut emoji is four bytes, which is donuts are four bytes. It makes sense. Um, and it's self-delimiting and self-aligning. So we've got, this, uh, we've got this basically like trains model where I've got a bunch of different sort of like little trains that can character carry bits on them. And the first train is a single car train, and it starts with a zero bit, and it has seven slots for bits. The second train is up to 11 slots, and it starts with a orange 110. And then the cars that the little locomotive piece pulls, the orange locomotives pull the purple cars. This one holds a total of 5 plus 6 is 11 bits. And then if we like go all the way to the bottom, we've got a four-byte a four byte train that holds up to 21 bits. And so when you look at uh, the bits of a Unicode UTF-8 character, there will always be a little locomotive for the first byte, and then potentially one, two, or three uh, bytes that start with one zero. And so it's really nice because these patterns don't overlap. So if you, if you get a byte and it says, you know, the very first bit is zero. You know it's a one-car train. If you get a byte and you know, and it starts with one zero, you, you know you're the second or third or fourth character of a of a byte that leads, and you'll like scan left. So if somebody hands you a file that's a megabyte and they say, "What's the character 
at position 500, you may look and see, oh, I didn't actually land on one of these like orange locomotive bytes. I got a uh, one zero car byte. And then you can scan forward or backwards to find a byte that's the beginning of a character. Um, it sounds a little abstract. I'll show a picture. So we take our cafe space donut. And we take these things and we use our Unicode code point table to look up the corresponding number for each of these letters. C is 67, and then that's that, those bits, and 97, those bits. And we get bits for every single character. You can see that like E with an accent is actually eight, eight bits, so it's not an ASCII character. Space is uh, only six. And then donut emoji, poor donut emoji, it's 127,849, and so it gets a much longer bit string. And then we just take those and we shove them in the corresponding train cars. So the very first one fits with a single byte. The E with an accent fits in two, and the donut fits in four. We can take this, and we can um, fill in the, the gaps. And then we can just take that and get a single sequence of, uh, of bytes. And so in this sequence of bytes, what you can see is that anywhere you are, you can always back up to the beginning of a character. And so UTF-8 is this really nice, powerful sequence where even if you have a file and it's truncated or some of it is missing or corrupted, you can still recover a lot of the data. You don't need to like always read from the beginning. So um, UTF-8, like I said, it's the best thing ever. Um, it's a superset of ASCII. So if you have an ASCII document, because ASCII documents are seven bits and the first bit is always zero, anything that's valid ASCII is also valid UTF-8. And it's uh, great for JSON and HTML because like the delimiter characters, the special characters like the less than sign and the quote are one byte. So when you're doing things like HTML, even if you're doing an HTML document that's Japanese or Chinese or just full of emojis, um, UTF-8 will still be an efficient compact encoding for it. So I've been talking a lot about characters. Uh, let's get like a little bit more modern and talk about colors. This entire talk is going to be talking about taking things, concepts, ideas, and representing them as bytes and zeros and ones. So let's, let's like, you know, change it a bit. Colors. So on a computer screen, every color is just represented as a combination of a pixel, a combination of pixels, and a pixel is generally, is generally made with three subpixels, a red subpixel, a green subpixel, and a blue subpixel. Generally, you don't see these because they're small. And then they're actually like really small. And so that's kind of like the, the look you get if you like hold your face right against your computer screen, or if you get a, a microscope to your computer screen. And I'm just going to represent that zoomed out as white. Um, so in this case, we've got a completely white color. And so that means that my red is at 255, my green is at 255, my blue is at 255. If I give every single one of those colors a range from 0 to 255, which is a single byte of uh, sort of like precision. So if I want to take this thing and I want to turn down the red to 0, then I get, uh, I'm basically left with CN because the green and blue cranked up to max is going to combine to make something that looks like CN. And with the red off, it's, uh, it's that. And so we can represent any color as a sequence of three bytes. And so one, one other interesting thing when we're talking about encodings is that if you send somebody three bytes, you have to have a pre-agreement as to whether those three bytes are going to be a color or a word. You could take like the ASCII string of dog, turn it into a color, and it might be a really cool color. It might be brown. Um, and then we can just change these numbers to anything to create any color, like this beautiful Android-like color. So the, uh, the colors, whenever programmers are thinking about colors, we're often thinking about them with respect to hexadecimal. And uh, we've just sort of like got a collection of tools that work really well with hexadecimal colors. Um, and so I'm going to use my colors as a just brilliant segue into talking about hex. Um, with decimal, we remember the digits are 0 through 9. With binary, they're 2 bits, 0 through 1. How do we do it in hex? where there's like no digit after nine. Ah, dramatic pause. All right. So with hexadecimal, the digits just go after nine. We say A. And so A would be 10 of those little squares. 
but we don't call it 10 as in one zero. We just think of it as 10, 10 units, 10 countable things. So the hexadecimal digits, hexadecimal digits go from zero through F. And we're going to take this exact same thing that we've seen too many times, the blue squares, and we're just going to turn this into hex. And so the way this works is take my 205 blue squares, and I'm going to just group them in groups of uh, powers of 16. And so I get 192, which is uh, 16 times 12, and then 13 remainders. And so that's the same as 12 times 16 plus 13 times 1 which is uh, 12 times 16 to the power 1, 13 times 16 to the power 0. We can just do this trick over and over again. I'm really good at it. And uh, that's the same as C, because C is 10, 11, 12, and D is 13. And so our hex number is OXCD. All right, so hexadecimal, as we did with binary, we have uh, 0B with hex. We use 0X, like 0XCD for 255. Um, when we represent bytes with hex, we always use two digits. So it's never zero, it's always zero, zero. And the reason for this that's really wonderful is that then if you have a sequence of bytes, you always get the two characters per byte. And if you have zeros, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, merge, you don't have any merge problems. So we always know that in the, this case, the middle byte of B6 is independent of the like the last byte and the first byte. You can uh, easily go from hex to the corresponding bytes, which is wonderful. So what do we use hex for? Well, the sort of motivation here was that we use them for colors. You can also see them in URL escapes, uh, Unicode code points, IPv6 addresses. Um, they're wonderful. All right, back to colors. We're out of hex, and so we've represented this Android color as CED2. One four, which is a, just a beautiful color. Um, so we can we can just play these tricks over and over again, where we layer things. We figured out how to represent a single color as three bytes, and we can just do the same trick to make an entire picture. Um, a picture is just a two D array of colors. Uh, we give three bytes per pixel. That means that a sixty four by sixty four icon is twelve thousand bytes, and a ten eighty by nineteen twenty picture is 5.9 megabytes. So that means compression is uh, a big deal. Um, pictures, uh, Android has this weird feature where you can use fewer bits per pixel. So instead of doing 0 to 255 with 8 bits per pixel, which is, you'll always see the string ARGB8888, which is just alpha, red, green, and blue, get 8 bits each. You can do RGB565 which is weird and asymmetric. Red gets five bits, green gets six bits, blue gets five bits. The green gets six bits instead of, it, it wins because uh, eye chemistry. And so, depending on the resolution of the screen, I don't know if you could tell in the bottom picture, it's ARGB8888. In the top one, it's 565. Because this is kind of hard to see on these screens, I'll artificially lower the color depth of this. So the top one here is 454 or dr quite dramatically, 232. Two. So uh, you can see that as we take away precision on each of the colors, the image just gets lousier. Um, so here is just like a complete indulgence on my part. I'm going to show you the entire code to write out a bitmap file. Um, and I just want to basically show you that there's like no magic to it. I think that generally as an industry, we're always afraid of doing things like, oh, I have to write this file oh, but I don't have a tool, I need a library to do it. Well, the libraries are written by people who are dumber than you are, and you can write your own libraries if you need to. Um, in this case, there's a bunch of like setup code where we figure out, we've got an array of integers, a 2D array of integers called pixels, and it has a width and a height. We compute some stuff for the BMP file format. Um, there's a BMP header, which is, uh, I think it's like these 40 bytes, and it's just like, a bunch of constants and the width and the height, and then like the width and the height in different forms. So that's the uh, BMP format. Um, at the beginning of this talk and at the end of this talk, there's a link to a GitHub repo that has all the code here if you want to play with it. Um, and then the last part, the most interesting part, is the pixel data. And so we have a 2D array of integers, and in basically like 50 lines of code, we can go from an array of colors into a, a bitmap file that you can open in MS Paint or your preferred program. 
Um, so when we're doing pictures on bytes, the, uh, this bitmap writer was about 50 lines of code. Writing a decoder is more difficult. In this case, I'm just writing an uncompressed, simple bitmap. If you want to write an a decoder that will read any bitmap, you have to handle a lot more cases than I do. And uh, good specs make it easy. So when people are designing binary protocols and binary specs and things, the specs want to be very simple so that it's completely unambiguous how much work you have to do. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the interesting things that were like hidden in the code and show you like the secrets of uh, the magic in binary encodings like for real. Uh, we see this here. It's a pixel ampersand OXFF0000 uh, <laughs> greater than, greater than, greater than 16. This doesn't look like the code you typically write as an Android programmer. Um, and so I'm just going to break it down. Uh, shifting and masking uh, let you take the bits out of a Java integer and just do stuff with them directly. Uh, the ampersand and or operators treat your 32-bit integer like it's a 32-element Boolean array. And the shift operators slide bits left and right. I'll do this visually because I think it's more fun. Um, here we have our Boolean expression. I've, I've picked that color that we had before, FFAB40, and then I'm masking it with uh, OO, OO, FF, OO, which should be like the green pixel if this was a color. And so my mask, my original color is the top line. My mask is the bottom line. And the way that this works is we just take every column and we do um, Boolean math on it. And we do like an AND operation. True and true is true. True and false is false. False and true is false. False and false is false. Both have to be basically ones for it to complete. So I'm going to slide this through, and the mask just like chops out the, uh, the ones where the mask has zeros. And we end up with just the uh, middle bit. The middle bit's the AB ones set. So that's the, uh, that's the ampersand operator. It looks really terrifying and scary and like, yikes, I'm going to have to interview a Google or something in order to do this hard work. But it's really just like pixel, uh, pixel, uh, pixel um, uh, sorry, uh, bit math. So there's that equation. And then we're going to do the shift. And the shift is like very simplistic once you understand it. We're going to take the eight bits to the right of this thing, and we're going to shift to the right. And so that means we just slide these over eight, and we end up with the, the bits that we were interested in as the rightmost bits in this image. And that's the bits that we can cast to a byte. So that's that part. Um, I'm going to go through another couple parts of this file just to show you that the, the tricks are all pretty straightforward. Um, we have a, uh, a, a loop here where we're going to pad the bitmap. And so we're just going to continuously write byte 0. And the easy way to think about this is that sometimes you're reading a book, and there's like a section that's blank. Um, the space intentionally left blank. Sometimes file formats put blank spaces in it so that the data that you want to read is aligned to the correct pages in memory. Uh, this is just like annoying work that you sometimes have to do. Um, and then the last bit is that these writers say write int le. That's uh, little endian and big endian. Big endian is what we normally sort of like think in. And the way this works is you take your 32-bit integer and you cut it up eight bits at a time. The first eight bits are the first eight bits, like so. And then little endian is the opposite, where we reverse things. So big and little endian are fun. Um, and like that sounds really terrifying, but once you know the trick, it's really boring. Magic. All right, data models. So we've got, um, we've got text. We've got pictures. But we're not text and picture programmers. We're application programmers. Let's build a conference app from the bits and the bytes all the way up. So in this case, our conference app has an ID, a, di a room, a title, and a speaker. We just use JSON for this. Everybody uses JSON for this, right? Yeah, everybody? Cool. Yep, that's the correct choice. <laughs> it builds on top of UTF-8. So you'll write your code as JSON, and then you'll use a UTF-8 encoder to convert that into bytes. JSON's awesome. It's easy to read and write. Um, so a JSON document has both the structure and the data. And in that case, I just mean that like we know that decoding the secrets of binary data is the name of the talk, but we also know where that, like, what the role of that string is. Um, and JSON uses this cape sequence as to be completely unambiguous. It's wonderful. Um, here's a date string. This is uh, the date of this talk. Um, and when you call system current time millis, you get a date as a long. 
that date as a long is like how we programmers encode dates. It's really simple. Um, a date that's eight bytes in memory is 22 bytes in JSON. So you get system current time millis, you have a long, and then you want to go write it and send it to your server. We've blown it up to 22 bytes. How lame and inefficient is that? So with space and time on encoding JSON, the message like that talk I showed is 128 bytes. And uh, it, basically, the bigger your sequence, the more bytes that your sequence has, the more time it's going to take to encode, decode, transmit, store. It's more expensive. Protocol buffers are like, you know, like super magic performance dust. Let's make our stuff like way faster. Let's use protocol buffers. Um, it's actually like very, very similar to JSON once you understand the like the bits. Protocol buffers are Google's small, fast, simple structured data format, and upon closer inspection, it's not that different from JSON. But it has a schema. So there's our uh, same JSON document, and now I've created a schema for it in protocol buffers. The schema is like almost looks like a class definition. The only thing that's interesting here is that uh, protocol buffer definitions force you to define a unique tag for every field. And that's just these integers. Um, there's a, uh, we're going to take that uh, talk and we're going to encode it in protocol buffers, and you'll just see how, uh, hopefully, you think it's simple. Um, there's a thing called a length mode in protocol buffers, and what it does is it just encodes the type in the data. So, so we've got our, uh, our length, date, room number, string, and string, and those are just looking things up in the length mode. And then uh, we can take the corresponding offsets and map them like so. So 5 is just 5 in bits. And then we take these numbers, we convert them into hex. Those are the bytes. And then in the protocol buffer format, we replace the strings with the corresponding bits. And then the, uh, the strings and integers, we just do the same tricks over and over and over again. So in this case, our number, take it, encode as hex, take our date, encode as hex. And we just do this over and over again. And we can get the uh, entire format all the way through. All right, I am out of time. We're going to take this protocol buffer. Small and fast, one byte for each field name. It's compact, and strings stay the same length. All right. <laughs> All right, let's rip through this. I'm almost done. Java I.O. Byte arrays are bad. They're mutable. Equals doesn't work. Doesn't implement comparable. Byte is signed. This is really terrible. The range is negative 128 to 127, but usually you want a signed value. Um, I'm going to just skip right through this. OKIO is Square's library that solves all these problems. Um, and we have our own type that replaces byte array that's called byte string, and it just works like string. So there's like some sample code. This is all in that GitHub project to read and write strings of bytes like they're strings of characters. And this entire section is not important. And <laughs> there is my next steps to takeaways. So everything that you're sending, everything that you're reading from the network, everything you're storing is bytes. Java strings are UTF-16. The encoded text is usually UTF-8. Um, hex is really handy if you're thinking about bytes or writing code that works in bytes, because it's like a really easy representation to think through. Don't be afraid of shifting and masking. Integers are bigger than little Indian. And Java's IO APIs are terrible. There's no black boxes. You can encode almost anything. And we make this library called OKO that makes it easy. That is it. And this, the code examples are all here. Thank you.